We've spent the first part of this chapter talking about waves in general and their properties, and now let's focus on waves traveling on a string under tension and see how we can have traveling waves on a string under tension, how fast they propagate, how you could even get standing waves on a string under tension, and how that dictates the vibrational states of the string and relates to harmonics and essentially how musical instruments work. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by applying Newton's second law to a little piece of string to get the wave equation for that string. And we'll do that by taking a string of mass m length l and putting it under tension, perhaps by wrapping it over a pulley with the mass and anchoring it on the other end. That's one way. It's not the only way, but that works. The point is that's what we're talking about, a string under tension, something in that manner or another, but it has to be um, under tension. It can't go slack. And we're going to then take a little piece of that string and apply Newton's second law to it with certain assumptions. So let's start by stating our assumptions and doing a little bit of prep work, and then we'll write Newton's second law. So the first part here of the assumption, which is more a definition of terms, is that the string has a length L, and the tension force is denoted by F sub T. Now we've used capital T in the past, but that's going to be confusing with periods, so in the waves chapter I tend to use F sub T for the tension force. Second assumption, or item on the assumption category here, is that um, the weight force is negligible in front of F sub t. In other words, mg is extremely small in front of the tension force, and we will therefore ignore weight in Newton's second law. Third item is that um, the string has no elasticity and no thickness. And then finally, we solely study transverse oscillations of small amplitude. So that would be oscillations in the y direction only. And if the amplitude is small, then we'll have dl is approximately dx. Now dl stands for the little piece of wire, that's the length, the infinitesimal length of that piece of wire, and dx is the width of this interval on the x-axis. So I exaggerated the slant of this piece of string just to make it obvious and to not overcrowd our drawing, but overall the oscillations are in the y direction and their amplitude remains quite small. And so under these assumptions, we can apply Newton's second law. And so what we would do is we would draw the tension force here on the left end, and we would call that F sub t of x and t. And in contrast here on the other end, we would have F sub t of x plus dx at the same time t. Here we'd get an angle. Here we would also get an angle. This would be theta of x and t. Here it's theta of x plus dx and t, and it seems tedious, but it's actually going to be helpful in the derivation, so bear with me. And then, um, well, that's, I mean, that's good enough. There is no weight force because it's uh, negligible in front of tension, but we should um, define a few quantities, or at least do a little bit of prep work just to make the derivation go um, a little faster and not get sidetracked during the derivation. So first things first, we're going to introduce mu, which is going to be the linear mass density of the string, its mass over length. And it will assume that it's constant. In other words, that the mass is uniformly distributed throughout the string. And so this is the linear mass density. Sometimes it's called lambda in other chapters, like gravitation. Um, not, not a very good name because lambda is wavelength, so we'll use mu. But mu is the linear mass density. And so that means that the mass of 
the string of length DL, well, the piece of string really, is then going to be, let me move this up, um, DM, that's the infinitesimal mass, is going to be mu, that's mass per length times the length. So mu DL, and DL is approximately DX anyway. So that's the mass of this piece of string here, which we're going to need to write Newton's second law. And so with that said, um, let's go over a couple other things. One is a quick reminder that if you have a function of two variables, f of x and t, and you write f of x plus dx t minus f of x t, that's actually the same thing as partial f, partial x, dx. And as an application of that, sine of theta, if you consider the right triangle here, because this angle here is also theta, then it's uh, opposite over hypotenuse. Now, opposite side is the change in height, so it's y of x plus dx t minus y of x and t divided by dl. Now, dl is approximately dx, so let's make that change downstairs, and we'll see that it simplifies with the numerator because the numerator truly is partial x partial sorry, partial y, partial x, dx, meaning that sine of theta is approximately partial y, partial x. All right, so that's uh, in preparation for the actual derivation. Now let's write Newton's second law in both the x and y directions, and we'll see that in the x direction there's no acceleration because we only look at transverse oscillations. And in the y direction, um, we're going to be able to simplify uh, with some help from the equation along the x direction. So f net x is what? It's f of t x plus dx t cosine of theta of x plus dx t minus f t of x and t cosine of theta of x and t. Now this should be technically dm times ax, but hey, ax is zero, so that is all equal to zero. And in addition to that, cosine of theta, because we're only dealing with um, oscillations with very small amplitude, the angle theta is actually going to be a small angle, and that means that cosine of theta is approximately one. That's actually the small angle approximation. And so the conclusion is that the tension force is actually independent of x because what you end up having is f of ft rather of x plus dxt is equal to ft of x and t. And so we're going to have a uniform tension. That will be useful in a second. In the y direction, Let's write f net y, so that's ft x plus dx t sine of theta of x plus dx t minus f sub t of x and t sine of theta of x and t, and that's dm a y. All right, now we know what dm is, it's mu dl, and we can summarize the first equation by writing ft x plus dx t is equal to ft x t is simply, we'll call it ft. It's uniform tension throughout the string. Um, and in the second equation, now bear with me, we're going to use our property here again, rather this one above, um, because we're going to recognize that this entire quantity is written at x plus dx and minus this quantity, which is the same quantity except it's written at x. And so what we get for the second equation is partial, partial x of f of t, f t x of t, sine of theta, x t, dx. 
is equal to dm is mu dl, and then ay is d2y dt squared. All right, so we can do one better now. We know that this tension force is independent of x, so we'll just call it f sub t, and we'll pull it out of the partial derivative. We're left with partial partial x of sine theta, which is actually partial y partial x. And then dx here is going to cancel with dl, because dl is approximately dx, and d2y dt squared. All right, so we get f sub t partial squared y over partial x squared. dx simplifies mu partial squared y partial t squared. And we can rearrange that um, because we want to put this in the form of the wave equation. So this is d2y dx squared is equal to mu over ft d2y dt squared. And recall that the standard form for the wave equation is a partial differential equation that looks like this, where c is the celerity of your wave, in other words, the speed at which the wave propagates. And so if we compare the two forms, we come to the conclusion that, first of all, this is the wave equation, so that's worth boxing right there. Second of all, that um, the celerity c, actually let me just I'll put it next to it, because might as well stay on the same page, um, c is equal to square root of ft over mu. And so if we have a string under tension, and we have a tension force that is much greater than the weight force, and we limit ourselves to small transverse oscillations, we get the wave equation with the celerity c that is a function of the tension and the linear mass density. And of course, the greater the tension, the faster the wave is going to propagate down the string. And so this proves that we can indeed have traveling waves on a string and certainly there's a, a few assumptions with this, but it's a classic derivation. It's good to know how to reproduce it. And it hopefully convinces you that the celerity c is square root of ft over mu, which is quite interesting because it means it doesn't depend on frequency. It's only a function of how much tension is exerted on the string in the first place, and then how the string basically is constructed, if you will. I mean, it's the mass and the length. So what do you make the string out of, and how long is it? Um, and you see that, for example, in uh, guitars, they all have the same length, but they have different materials or different amounts of um, metal wire wrapped around them. Or the harps have different lengths and so forth. And that's the reason. It's because the celerity is a function of uh, tension and linear mass density. Thanks for watching this video. We created Cogverse Academy to help you save time by focusing on what matters most when studying for exams. If you'd like to learn how Cogverse Academy can personally help you improve your grades, check us out at cogverseacademy.com and send us an email if you have any questions. We'd love to help you.